This uh, past week, as, as daytime temperatures began to consistently reach highs in the 80s, I came in here one day this week and I crossed my fingers and I reprogrammed our thermostats to see if the air conditioning units would come on in, uh, in time to keep us comfortable for today when we uh, had our, our scheduled worship service. And uh, with that, uh, other than the one in the office back there where I stay, which don't matter, everything else which is working fine. In addition to the, the usual duties that uh, I usually do, I've been working around my house, uh, doing some pressure washing and, and making some repairs here and there as needed. And I was thinking the other afternoon uh, while I was out at the yard, it's hard to believe that in two months it'll be 37 years since Dee Dee and I borrowed some money and purchased the first and only home we've ever owned. And with the time that has passed since our house was brand new, there's always something broken now or something that, that needs some attention. I remembered how excited we were when we drove to the lawyer's office in Conyers for the closing and how long that day seemed when we discovered that once we got there that some of the lender's paperwork had, had been delayed. Six hours later, when the proceedings finally started, uh, we were asked to read and sign dozens of documents indicating our understanding and agreement with, with whatever the document said. Each time I signed my name, a lady would pick up the paper and she would sign a statement that said she saw me sign. And then I would sign another document acknowledging that I saw her sign the paper that said she saw me sign it. That nonsense went on for a long time, and, and when that nonsense was finished, the same document was passed to Dee Dee, and that whole process started all over again. Before becoming official homeowners, we must have signed 40, 50 documents. And while I came to that closing with the intent to view every document with the appropriate degree of scrutiny, somewhere around the fifth or sixth document, I gave up and quit pretending that I knew what any of it said. All I know is it's when it was uh, all said and done, they gave us two sets of keys, and we've been in Ellenwood ever since. That said, to this day, I still have it, but I've never read the entire contract that began the blessing that our home has been for all those years. Through the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross, all believers are parties to a contract with God known as the New Covenant. What is the new covenant and what makes it new? To adequately answer that question, it helps to have a, a general understanding of all the previous covenants God made with humans as they're recorded in the Bible. And while there are seven in total, for this morning's purposes, we're only going to talk about three. That's God's covenant with Abraham, the Mosaic covenant, and the aforementioned new covenant. So the three covenants that we're examining this morning share a commonality in that they all concern God's promises to the nation of Israel. In simple terms, like the mortgage that allowed me and Dee, Dee to buy our home, a covenant is an agreement between two parties. There's two types of biblical covenants, unconditional and conditional. As previously said, an unconditional covenant is an agreement between two parties However, only one of those parties is unilaterally obligated to do something. In, in other words, nothing is required of the other party. And perhaps the best example of an unconditional covenant is found in Genesis 12, 2 through 3, where God essentially summarizes his covenant with an individual at the time whose name was Abram. Determined to call out a special people for himself, God tells Abram, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Later, in some of the fine print of this covenant, God also promises uh, Abraham, descendants, uh, a specific parcel of land. And these descendants would eventually become the nation of Israel. Notice that as God summarizes his covenant with the people, five times he says, I will. 
While Abraham's faithful obedience and trust were expected, the phrase you will is not listed in this covenant's terms. Clearly, God takes the onus of keeping this covenant on himself. Why? God knew that Abraham believed his promises because his beliefs consistently translated into action and obedience. Therefore, the Lord simply said, Abraham, because you've done these things, I'm going to do these things. So in, a, in the absence of any God-stated requirements on Abraham's part, this covenant is unconditional. It never expires, and therefore it remains valid and divinely enforceable today. Pastor Chris, why does this covenant matter to us? In Galatians 3, 5 through 7, the Apostle Paul writes, I ask you again, does God give you the Holy Spirit and work miracles among you because you obey the law? Of course not. It's because you believe the message you heard about Jesus Christ. In the same way, Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. The real children of Abraham then are those who put their faith in God. So here Paul advances the idea of a spiritual family sharing faith in God rather than a bloodline. Eighteen centuries later, Jesus came to earth to fulfill the promised blessing of the Abrahamic uh, covenant to the nation of Israel. Ultimately, these same blessings were extended to Gentiles who sought a faith relationship with Jesus. The second covenant I want to look at this morning is God's covenant with the nation of Israel made at Mount Sinai. This so-called Mosaic covenant, also known as the Old Covenant, centered around God's divine law given to Moses on the mountain summit. Unlike God's covenant with, with Abraham, the Mosaic covenant wasn't permanent, nor was it unconditional. Instead, it was a temporary administrative covenant that promised God's blessings if his perfect law could be kept and a curse if people failed. It's important to understand that in contrast to the unconditional covenant God made with Abraham, an individual human, the Mosaic Covenant was a conditional agreement with a nation of people requiring both parties to fulfill certain conditions. Despite many good and intentional individual efforts, time has told us that imperfect, sinful men and women cannot live according to God's perfect law. As a result, rather than being blessed by the Mosaic Covenant, those who tried to approach God through it were cursed because they were hopelessly unable to fulfill their end of the agreement. Now God, the knower of everything known, knew that this would be the case. So why did he even propose such an agreement? What's up with that? In Galatians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul asked that same question and answers that same question. Beginning in verse 19, Paul writes, Why then was the law given? It was given alongside the promise to show people their sins, but the law was designed to last only until the coming of the child who was promised. So the Lord instituted the Mosaic Covenant so that mankind would learn that they can't earn God's promised blessings based on their works. In essence, God was preparing men and women to receive a Savior. Now, now that we have a little bit of background, let's see if we can answer our initial question. What is the new covenant? The new covenant, first of all, replaces the old covenant. It's a new unconditional covenant that promises God will forgive sin and restore perfect eternal fellowship with those whose hearts turn towards him with faith in the saving work of a perfect Jesus Christ. You don't have to take my word for that. Uh, Hebrews 8, 13 tells us that when God speaks of a new covenant, it means he has made the first one obsolete. It is now out of date and will soon disappear. Why would a perfect God sacrifice a perfect son for hopelessly corrupt and perfect humans? Colossians 1, 19 through 20 tells us that for God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ and through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Jesus Christ, the perfect son of God, reconciled the penalty of sin on our behalf and became the mediator of the new covenant 
And his undeserved death on the cross is the basis of that promise. Notice the inclusiveness of this statement, of this scripture. Through Christ, God makes peace with all things and all people. So while the new covenant began as an agreement with the nation of Israel, by his grace, God brought all mankind into its blessing. If you follow our Facebook page, you may have noticed that I promoted this morning's message using the title, New Covenant Prayer for Dummies. You might be asking, what does all this talk about Old and New Covenants have to do with prayer? In 61 of his 66 books, the Bible makes approximately 1,100 distinct references to prayer. Consequently, like the New Testament, the Old Testament contains many examples of prayer, and we often see God answering those prayers. Therefore, it's safe to say that people have always been able to approach God in prayer. However, under the Old Covenant, prayer, the answers to prayer, and one's relationship with God were not the same as they are under the new covenant. Why? In the Old Testament, individuals who sought a prayer relationship with God had to continually offer sacrifices to receive forgiveness for the sins they committed. Said another way, they were perpetually unable to draw near to God because of sin. With what I just said in mind, I ask you to consider these two passages from the Old Testament. Proverbs 28, 9 says that God detests the prayers of a person who ignores the law. In Isaiah 59, 2, the prophet writes, It's your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, he has turned away and will not listen anymore. So under the old covenant, man's propensity to sin made an effective prayer life an almost impossible, arduous challenge, offering little opportunity to be to be heard by God. In contrast, under the new covenant, the believer's relationship with God significantly changed, including the extent to which God hears and answers our prayers. We now live as adopted children of the Father and co-heirs of the Son, sealed and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And with that spiritual promotion in mind, Let's look at what Jesus told his disciples that they should expect from prayer after his ascension to heaven and the promised indwelling of the Holy Spirit. In John 16, 23 through 24, Jesus says, At that time, you won't need to ask me for anything. I'll tell you the truth. You will ask the Father directly, and he will grant your request because you use my name. You haven't done this before. Ask using my name and you will receive, and you will have abundant joy. So I don't think we can say the same thing about Old Testament prayer. Jesus' death on the cross fulfilled all the conditions God laid down for receiving his promises and blessings. As I was looking at this this week, I, I love the way that, that Paul, over in 2 Corinthians, essentially says the same thing. In uh, 2 Corinthians 1 through 20, Paul writes, For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. And through Christ our amen, which means yes, ascends to God for his glory. So now that the perfect son is, is seated at the Father's right hand, interceding on our behalf, our prayers are certain to be heard by the Father, and we can expect an answer according to God's perfect will. Amen? Furthermore, as God answers our prayers, God is glorified. No longer must we wonder, am I in the right relationship with God that I may go to Him in prayer and know that He hears me and will respond? The bottom line is that through Jesus, God hears the prayers of his children. As those living under the new covenant of grace, we should view this privilege as a game changer. Holding that privilege, let me encourage you to increase your commitment to daily prayer for your personal needs and the needs of others. In our remaining time this morning, I want to show you five biblical truths concerning new covenant prayer. I've chosen to present the first two truths as answers to two fundamental questions. 
The first question is, is what is prayer and how does it work? In its most basic definition, prayer is simply the privilege of talking to God. Consequently, prayer isn't the same thing as secular practices such as meditation or reflection. Instead, it's a direct two-way spiritual conversation between the human soul and the Lord who created us. Prayer is our primary way of communicating our emotions and desires to God and a means of fellowship with Him. So that makes prayer very important to us. The second question is, is why should we pray? There are many reasons why we should pray. We're going to take a few minutes to just look at a few of those. God's will for every human was established long before we were born into this world. Therefore, upon our arrival, God already knows the future needs of our circumstances, and he chooses to provide them to us according to his will. According to his word, he knows every detail of every moment of our lives, every thought we will ever have, and every word we will ever speak. He knows the length of our earthly days and the number of hairs on our heads, and I, I imagine that's probably a much easier job with some of us than it is with others. So if God knows what we need and provides it accordingly, why should we pray? When Jesus saved me, God didn't hand me an itinerary with detailed instructions for the rest of my life that said even if he had, I wouldn't have been able to understand all those instructions because my future circumstances and challenges were unknown to me. There was no experience to shed any light on the challenges that would inevitably come my way. Instead, God moved in, and he opened my heart to a, a new and deeper understanding of his word in the Bible. He gave me direct access to him through prayer, and he filled me with his Holy Spirit to help make all that make sense. My salvation is the vehicle that makes my relationship with, with God possible. But again, rather than handing me, you know, instructions and simply saying, here's the plan. The spirit within me walks with me step by step along the path God has pre-established for me. However, as I have often, I've wandered off the path or allowed it to become so overgrown with things that could trip me up or cause me to take the wrong fork in the road ahead at times. When we feel lost, or, or we don't know which path to take, prayer is the means of discerning God's will. Prayer may consist of simply saying, okay, God, what's next? Or remind me again, or how do I make this ministry work? It's like a, a popular song from the 1970s by an artist named Peter Frampton, titled, I Want You to Show Me the Way. In the internet age, whenever I need to go somewhere that I've never been, I, I never look at a map like my daddy used to. Instead, I use the GPS on my phone to get the driving directions I need. And while my phone knows the complete route, it only gives me a few turn-by-turn -turn directions as needed because that's what I can handle. That's how prayer works. Now let's read Ephesians 3.20. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. When we pray, we demonstrate our faith that God will keep his promises and bless our lives abundantly more than we could ask or hope for. And in answering our prayers, God glorifies himself. He has a purpose behind that which is to glorify himself. The third biblical truth concerning new covenant prayer is that beyond an invitation to pray, we're instructed to pray not only for our own needs, but for the needs of others. If you were here, and I think most of you were, for our recent study in the book of James, you may recall that in James chapter 5, verse 16, James reminds us that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. In terms of what we say to God when we pray, what ensures that our prayers are powerful and effective? 
In Ephesians 6, 18, Paul tells us to pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. In Philippians 4, 6, he says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. And in Colossians 4, 2, Paul instructs us to devote yourself to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Now let's look at what he says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always. I'm going to read it in the version that's on the screen. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. If you're seeking God's will for your life and you don't know where to start, try using these four passages as an outline and I think you'll see God begin to work in your life. The fourth biblical truth concerning New Covenant prayer is that we can pray with confidence. We can pray with confidence. In Philippians 4, 6 through 7, Paul says, again, he says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. In 1 John 5, 14, John writes, I have written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. We are confident that he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. In Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13, God himself says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. So, as Hebrews 4, 16 says, So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it the most. Isn't that a promise, man? Amen. The fifth biblical truth concerning New Covenant prayer concerns the relationship between prayer and faith. Simply said, prayer gets its power from faith. Now there's many books that have been written with titles. I, I saw some of those this week. The Power of Prayer or 12 Steps for Harnessing the Power of Prayer. Somewhere along the way, we've gotten the idea that prayer makes faith work. I need to tell you that that's not the way it is. I need to tell you that it doesn't. It's faith that makes prayer work. Faith will work without prayer, but prayer won't work without faith. Without faith, there's no power in prayer. Faith, even as small as the size of a mustard seed, is the engine behind the power of prayer. Prayer with faith in Jesus links us to God, the source of all power. You may recall again from our study in James, uh, specifically James 1, 5 through 8, James tells the Jewish believers living in exile that if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed about by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in, in all they do. So if you pray without faith, you shouldn't expect to receive anything from the Lord. In my mind, that makes the word expect a key word in this scripture. You can balance the words faith and expect like this. Faith equals expect. Faith equals expect. Jesus' words as recorded in Matthew 21, 18 through 22 also imply a connection between faith and prayer. Beginning in, in verse 18, Matthew writes early 
in the morning as Jesus was on his way back to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. Immediately the tree withered. When the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so quickly, they asked. Jesus replied, truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Before we dismiss, I just want to ask you all a few questions. Do you believe that Jesus healed a blind man? Do you believe that Jesus turned water into wine? Do you believe that, that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead? Do you believe that Jesus healed the sick and cast out demons? I do too. I, I think most of us do. What does Hebrews 13, 8 say? It says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. With... With that, this verse means that Jesus is still a healer. Jesus is still raising men from spiritual death. Jesus is still performing miracles. Jesus is still a counselor. Jesus is still comforting the brokenhearted. Jesus is still casting out demons and addictions. So when you pray, pray big. But don't misunderstand prayer and its relationship with faith. Because... Prayer is not a tool set to obtain what we want. That, that would put us in control of our lives. Instead, faith is a mindset based on the finished work of Jesus Christ that aligns our prayers and our wants with God's character, God's will, God's love, and God's power. It, it's faith that should drive us to persist in prayer. Remembering you're not going to change God or his will by praying. Instead, prayer changes you. Prayer helps you bridge the gap between your wants and wishes and God's will for you. So what does the real life application of today's message look like? If we're not actively engaged in consistent prayer or don't know how, where do we start? The Greek word translated prayer in the New Testament is a combination of two other Greek words that mean worship and request. So when we realize that prayer is a combination of worship and request, I think we can better imagine those nights that Jesus spent all night praying, worshiping his Father in praise and love, asking the Father to lead him and to meet the daily needs of the people who followed him. Jesus is God, so who would better know how to pray? What I want you to see this morning is that praise and worship is an essential element of prayer. Now, most of y'all know that, that I grew up in a Christian home, and I attended Sunday school and church every Sunday, and I was baptized when I was 15 years old. Four years Later, I started missing a Sunday here and there, and before I knew it, I hadn't been to church in 20 years, let alone talk to God about anything. While God had always, to this day, has always been good to me, life happens, and suddenly the good life that, that I'd been living wasn't so good anymore. And a point came when I finally decided it was time to get reacquainted with the God who saved me. The truth is, while I was raised in the church and I had no doubts that God had saved me, I barely knew God. I, you know, I tried to pray, but I didn't know what to say. I think, you know, perhaps pride stood in the way for a while. Y'all have all heard that song, Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. <laughs> Still... You know, I wanted to pray, and it sure seemed to be working for some of the people around me. So I began to take a few minutes here and there to simply just praise God for the good things in my life. I'd see something good, and I, I you know, thank you, God. I praise you for that. Later, 
I found it easier to thank him for the things that, that didn't seem so good. And I began to occasionally ask him to make some of those things better. And while I shouldn't have been, I was shocked when God started talking back. Eventually, I learned to pray for what I thought I needed and more importantly, for his will. And later, I began to read God's word occasionally. And through that, as he slowly revealed his plan for my life and his will for me, the things I asked him for began to better align with his plan. And as it turns out, I didn't really need some of the things that I had been asking him for. So, if you don't have a consistent prayer life or you don't know how, let me encourage you to just start out by just looking around, find something good in your life, and thank God for it, and then go from there. Amen? Amen. So, with all that said, as we leave this place today to begin another glorious week of many more to come, let me encourage you to rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances as you connect, equip, serve, and encourage one another. Why? For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Father God, we thank you for the gift of prayer. Even though there are many things in this world that remain a mystery to us, we know that prayer is a necessity. And we exercise the privilege fully confident and both your ability and your willingness to do far more than we could ever imagine or guess. Help us, then, to pray for big things so that we may see your glory and your matchless power. Enable us to pray big with confident expectation of your perfect answers. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll see you guys next week.